Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 12. Hear these words. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Cue the background. <laughs> and for the sake of understanding today, our, uh, Otis mentioned to me this morning that he needed to change the battery and the clock in the back. I don't know where, where that came from. It may be something from a sermon past or whatever, but it still hasn't been changed yet, so it's just now 9 o'clock. This passage again walks us along this experience that we're taking this Lenten season between Ash Wednesday and Easter Sunday that we're trying to really explore and get a handle on what is the story. And it starts with what's your story? That's the question we've been asking every week. What's your story? And your story has some particular parts to it that need to be rekindled in each of us. As we kind of come together and put it down for ourselves, our story has a special beginning. Our story has some elements to it that are important and significant in how we can not only take an inventory of what our life has been like along this walk of discipleship, but what it is that we have to share with someone else. Today... We come back to this idea of what is your story. And using the scriptures and the experience of Jesus and our own experience now, we ask yet another question that helps us kind of get a handle on part of what is your story and my story. And the question today was waiting for the right time. And that's where I started with this because it seemed to me that over and over again what this passage seems to point out is that there's a question about the timing and when things are going to happen here. But Jesus is on a set schedule to the cross. And he knows the timing, and God knows the timing. It's the disciples and the others around him that may be confused in the moments. And what's witnessed here in this story is that Mary, in her heart, may have no idea about what the timing is. But her heart and spirit is saying, now. Now's the time. She can't explain it. She was saving this perfume for Jesus' death, a time to anoint the body, but, but it seems to her in that moment she's going, what am I waiting for? Maybe this is the right time. And without a word, then, she gets the oil and she begins to place it on Jesus' feet. And it says in the scripture, the aroma of the perfume just penetrates and shares and goes across the room to where everybody knows. It's not a secret anymore. Probably nobody noticed it at first, but then slowly but surely, what's that, what's that smell? And then they begin to look for the source. Did somebody spill something? Did something happen? And then they discover Mary at the feet of Jesus. Well, after all, it was a party to honor Jesus, wasn't it? It was a celebration of him and what he's about. I mean, he had raised Lazarus from the death. Uh, perhaps this was a thank you party of some kind, you know. Maybe there at that scene, someone said, Jesus, when you, give, you come back. We're having, we're having dinner for you, man. This is going to be awesome. Lazarus himself is sitting, reclining at the table with Jesus. What a wonderful image. The resurrected image of Lazarus speaking to the Christ, the Messiah, who soon would be died and resurrected himself. It was a sacred moment. 
something told Mary, now is the time. Well, I really think that there's a question that comes to us when we think about our own experiences because maybe in your life you've had some moments like this where you seem to be following some kind of schedule that you understood or that you thought God and you understood and then God changes the schedule some way and things happen in a different sequence than what you planned. Maybe now becomes the time instead of later. And it raises two questions for us that we have to all work with in our life of discipleship. The first question is this, if not now, when? Those moments in your life and experience where you sense that God's in your midst and that he's nudging you in some way in his spirit to say, I want you to do this now. I need you to do this now, not later. I need you to do it now. And you're finding yourself over and over again going, God, maybe I don't think I'm ready yet. God, I don't think it's time yet. Wait a minute, God, I'm not, I'm not prepared for this. This is the worst time. And God keeps saying to you over and over again, I want it now. I want you to do it now. Well, the real question that hits us there is, if not now, then when are we going to do it? When will it mean the most? Later on when I think I'm prepared or now when God is nudging me in his spirit to do what I know I need to do? You ever had that moment in your life when you're doing something, it's really the unexpected of the moment, but you just find yourself needing to do it? You're standing in that line, you're watching the person in front of you, and something inside of you says, say something? speak to that person and you don't know why but you say hello and you say hello and then you find out that it was God's timing all along it had nothing to do with you that he had a plan in that conversation I shared with you last week about the conversation with the young man at the table um, where we were talking about things about the play and and in the course of the conversation we're asking the questions because we're doing an inventory for the bulletins and everything you know what churches do you go to and this young man was asked as we're sitting at the table because of the rain we were inside and he's being asked what church do you go to and he names the church and then we start you know the person that's asking the question starts to write it down to make that list and there's a pause and he looks up and looks at me and he says but we hadn't been in about a year. He's holding his little baby in his arms. And I sat there kind of quietly for a minute, and I felt that spirit nudging me. I felt that moment when I'm thinking there's something going on here. There's a conversation. He, I guess he knows I'm a pastor. I don't know. And then he says, God called me to preach at one point in my life. But then something happened that made me step away from it. And I haven't been back since. There was that nudging in my, my heart that said, you can't let that go. You're at this table, this time, for this reason. And that young man just showed you, just spoke it out. And what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Now, there's a part of me that's going, you know, i got enough going on in my life right now. You know, it's, here it is. Saturday, it's raining outside, it's terrible, I don't have time for this. God, I'll get around, I'll get his name or something. It'll be in the program, I'll give him a call later. No, God was saying, if not now, when? The second question that comes in these moments is when you feel the Spirit kind of nudging you again and it's saying, if not you, then who? Because we tend to say, well, I don't even know the young man. And he really doesn't know me. I just happened to be sitting across the table when he said that. I'm sure someone else in this room heard it. Oh, surely there's someone's going to reply to that. And I waited and no one was saying anything. A young man had just said, I haven't been to church in a year, and no one was saying anything. And then I blurted these words out. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, well, don't give up on God. You need to be in a church. And if not yours, then come to mine. I don't know what made me do it. But it seemed like if it wasn't me, then who was it going to be? You ever had that moment in your life? Is that part of your story where you've had those experiences that you've felt that nudging of God's Spirit in your life in a particular situation and circumstance where you felt those two questions coming into your heart and you hear that Word of God saying to you, if not now, when? 
And if not you, then who? Instead, we keep wanting to wait for the right time. We keep wanting to wait for that moment that we can feel good about it, that we can get guaranteed success, and we can put God on our schedule. And that's not how God works. And the disciples were there at a celebration with Jesus, and the anointing oil that she was bringing out was not meant for this moment. It was meant for a later time. And even Judas gets in the mess of this, and he says to himself, well, think about the worth of the oil that's being used and how it could be used in a different way. Everybody had a reason why it didn't need to be happening right now at this time by that person. But the Spirit spoke differently. Spirit said to Mary, if not now, when? And if not you, then who? And she responded. I can think of my life, and there have been people in the course of my experience that have stepped in at times that I least expected it. They have been there for me. They have given me that nudge, and they have just said simple things like, God just told me to do this for you. God just, I just feel like you need this, and I want to help you. I can't tell you why. I don't want anything back. I just want to help you right now. And they say things to you that change you without even knowing it even. Someone says to you, you need to go rest. Take care of yourself. Those words can be powerful. Spoken in the right situation, the right time, the nudging of the Spirit working in that life to say to you, you need this. If not now, when? If not you, then who? God's worked that for you in your life. Is that part of your story? Can you name moments that someone has just been there unexplained and you can't necessarily say why, but in your heart, in your, no, in your knowledge, in your spirit, you suddenly realize that God's at work here? That's why that happened at this time, at this place, by that person? Well, I was really feeling good about this message for a while, just so you know that. And then I had this friend that went to see Medea's um, uh, final tour. Anybody know who Medea is? Yeah, we all know, don't we? I'm a fan, but I know it's edgy sometimes, but then there's always seems to be a truth underneath it somewhere. And, and, and when I asked this friend of mine how it went, this is what I heard. Well, I went, and it was great. It was a stage presentation, not a movie. It was the actual stage presentation by some of the main characters from all the different movies. And what you discover is that hidden behind all that talent and what you see on the screen are some lives that really are very different in some places. And she said, a couple of them really could sing, could sing really good. And, and she said to me, actually, what happened was revival broke out. By the time we got to the end, they were all saying, we got to end this with a gospel song. We got to end this with a gospel song. And they had church. They stepped out of the characters. The, the play itself was over with, and they spent another 30 to 40 minutes just praising God and, and bringing worship. Now, I don't know about you, but, I mean, to me, that sounded pretty cool. And I started asking more questions about it, and then a song was shared with me that was sung at that experience. And it was like God was in, as I listened to that song, it was like God saying, uh, Richard, you need to change that sermon title. And I thought, what? It's already in the bulletin. God saying, no, I want you to change it. Because you're making it sound real hard right here. You're saying waiting for the right time, like that's what we're doing and everything. But it really boils down to something very simple for every one of us. It's simply this. God provides. That's all you need to say. Jesus is in that moment of moving towards the cross, and God is there anointing him and anointing his body for the death that is to come. God is providing through Mary and that whole experience, contrary to everything that's set up in the room, a moment, a sacred moment that God is providing for his life and his need in that moment. And Jesus even speaks that to Judas when he says, you're going to have the poor among you for a long time, but you're only going to have me for a short time now. And God knows it. God knows if not now, then when. And God knows if not you, then who. And my story and your story has some pieces of that as well. You have experiences in your life as a Christian, perhaps, that you have witnessed the moments that God has provided for you. The very person that took it to heart when they felt the nudging of the Spirit that said, if not now, when. 
Now's the time. If not you, then who? I need you, not someone else. And maybe that's what's happening in your life even now. I want, you to, I want you to hear this song that I heard and kind of hear the words of it and the message of it. And um, this style of music may not be yours necessarily. It's a gospel song, so it's, it's got a little jazz to it maybe. But the words are powerful. And the words remind us over and over again. I don't know where you are right now in your life. You may be the very person in this room right now that God needs to provide for. Maybe you're the very one that needs to know that God will provide for your need and for your moment. And you won't always know where it's coming from. But also maybe you need that nudging of the Spirit right now too that lets you know that the very person that's next to you that needs God may be coming to you in this moment today and saying, if not now, when are you going to do it? And if not you, then who can I get? Maybe this song speaks to all of us. God will provide through you and for you. Let's listen. God provides, so why do I worry about my life? When you come to my rescue a thousand times, every other voice it is a lie. God provides, God provides. In ways I can't explain and can't deny The little that I have, He multiplies Just when I feel He won't show up on time God provides He'll come through When the clouds of doubt rain down on you and test everything you thought you knew Now you finally see what God can do For you So tonight Close your eyes, there's no more need to fight Watch God provide God provides It's hard to say when there's no food to eat Or oh, what you see feels all that life will be And will this be another year of misery For me But my faith Can't survive on just things I see God provide, yeah. He will provide before your eyes. Oh, He will, He will. So close your eyes. There's no more need to.
Towards the end of that song, the words are said, He will open up the heavens and provide. And He has. For you, for me, for that young man sitting across the table from me, for every person you meet, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen.